Hi, my name's Phil, I like to talk about politics. So, discussed uh, a little around the politics around the Brexit deal, which uh, will be voted through by Westminster later this week, and then by the European Parliament sometime next month, I think. In theory, they could vote against it. Uh, I'm not sure that's going to be likely. Now, there are a number of areas of the deal that I'd like to discuss in a bit of detail this week. But I'm going to start off with uh, an overview of what it's going to mean ultimately for ordinary people, but really in terms of the Brexit arguments and in terms of the overall UK economy. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So there are multiple parts to the deal. It isn't just about trade, but that is uh, the one that the public will be mostly attuned to. You know, it'll also cover a number of other important areas of, of cooperation, including, of course, travel and security. But most people are interested in the trade aspects. It's what the media plug. It's what ultimately is going to be important to everyone in the country because jobs will depend on that. So we'll have a look at that first. So with trade, there are, of course, services and goods. In terms of UK EU trade, the EU has a surplus in trade in goods. In other words, they, in terms of value, trade more goods to us than we do to them. So trading goods is more important to the EU. The UK has a surplus in trading services. So the UK is more interested in the trade in services. The, de the deal basically covers goods and not really services. The New York Times, which is a paper from a neutral country uh, outside either area, quoted a former director of the Institute for Public Policy Research, which is a British-based think tank. And, and that quote was, the result of the deal is that the European Union retains all of its current advantages in trading, particularly with goods, and the UK loses all of its current advantages in trade for services. The outcome of this trade negotiation is precisely what happens with most trade deals. The larger party gets what it wants and the smaller party rolls over. And this is exactly what has happened. It's what Remainers warned about for years. Yes, the UK is a powerful economy. Yes, in general terms, it's a powerful country. But it is a much smaller economy and much less powerful than the combined EU. Brexiteer arguments were all based on the notion that Britain does not fit the laws of global economics or politics. They couldn't argue with the general idea that, of course, you know, when you've got trade negotiations and you've got a really big block and you've got a smaller party, that, of course, the smaller party is going to come away with much less. That's undeniable. You know, you'd have to be an infant not to be able to grasp that. But they said, we're special. You know, we're special and we don't fit the accepted wisdom. Doesn't apply. Well, do you know what? We're only as special as any other country. All countries are special. It's just like all children are special to their parents. You know, we are special to the people of this country. France is special to the French and America is special to the Americans and China is special to the Chinese and so on. But on the world stage, we're not. You know, the laws of international trade and cooperation do apply. And, and those laws dictated that we had no chance of delivering what was promised. This is a deal that preserves basically what the EU needed without denting the integrity of their single market. What's more, politically, Brexit has already caused anti-EU groups in other EU countries. Remember, it's not only Britain that had Eurosceptics. Other countries still do as well. But they've fallen away dramatically over the last few years. People have looked at what is the mess of Brexit and gone, do you know what? Do we fancy some of that? No, we do not. Economically, the case for the EU will be made even stronger as people are able to compare how EU countries have done compared to the UK over the next few years. Brexiteers have tried to suggest, and they're still talking about the EU collapsing in the medium term and the UK flourishing. Uh, these are the same people who said we'd get all the benefits of membership with none of the drawbacks. At every step of the way, when you look at what they've said would happen, it has been a lie. Or a statement of ignorance. Put it how you like. And the same is happening now, of course. And you know when you're looking at you know when you're looking at digital subscriptions to things and there's different forms of it? And it shows a range, you've got your different subscriptions, it's got tick boxes, ticks and crosses and things indicating what you get with each option. And obviously you get more ticks with the more expensive subscription. 
Well, the EU produced a handy graphic showing this for this deal as well. You know, it shows what we had as members, including freedom of movement, trading goods, trading services, air transport, road transport, energy and EU programmes, including the Erasmus scheme that I talked about yesterday. Now, on that trading front, we can see that when it comes to trading goods, the aspect of trade most important to the EU does actually cover some important areas. You know, there's a big tick on tariff and quota free there. And there's a few, the circles indicate that um, you get something with it. It's not like it was before there are certain conditions. And, uh, but when it comes to trading services, it's just crosses, that's there's, there's nothing, we don't get anything. Now that being said, I did say before the deal was agreed that the EU would probably do us a few favors. If we, you know, if we agreed the deal, um, it's a bit like when we agreed terms on the Northern Ireland Protocol, which was earlier this month. We finally agreed terms on that. And the EU said, right, thank you. You've, you've, you've now behaved. You've, you've done what we wanted. So here's a few sweeteners. Here's a, here's a thank you. Um, for example, one big issue is technically we can't trade chilled meat from, we can't export that from Britain to Northern Ireland, third country and all that. And the deal does nothing really there. Um, but... What they said was, look, you know, this is a problem. We'll do you a favor. We'll give you a bit of a grace period on this uh, to sort it out. So did us a few favors. And um, they didn't have to do that. It's not covered by the agreement, but they're willing to throw in a few things because they got what they want. You know, they're not in it just to be, uh, to be in it spiteful. You know, of course, they're going to help their allies. And the same is true of this deal. It's exactly what the EU wanted, including on fishing, which I'll go over in, uh, in the next video, I think. But needless to say, the Brexiteer fishing groups are fuming. I said that there's no way that Johnson would actually be interested in fishing, that it was just a handy distraction and that he'd fold completely if all the other issues were sorted out. But yeah, that's for later. Now with services, I believe the EU are gonna be a little helpful with us and do us a few favors, not legally required of them, but, you know, just to take the edge off Brexit. That being said, some of those measures will, of course, be time limited and others could be cancelled at any time because they have no obligation uh, to do anything for us. Um, and what it will mean is it will mean that service providers in the UK will be trading in a volatile market. So even the ones who get some sort of uh, equivalent agreement, it won't be a formal agreement. It will just be a, an assessment by the EU. It could be taken away at any time. The bottom line is that such businesses will be strongly encouraged to set up EU offices, as many already have, in order to be able to carry out trade without problems. They will also, this is the absolute killer, they will also be more likely to employ EU citizens as workers. Another Brexit irony, really. You know, the Brexiteers kept saying that leaving the EU would mean more jobs for British workers. Well, you know, for example, for those well-paid international service providing jobs, it's actually the opposite. Thanks to Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson, do you know what? An EU citizen in the UK now has more rights than a UK citizen. In the UK, an EU citizen has more rights than a British citizen. You have to laugh at the insanity of the situation. It isn't, it's not just that what the Brexiteers promised hasn't come true. We're actually getting the exact opposite of what was promised. An EU-based worker in the UK has all the same rights as a UK citizen, plus all their EU rights as well, including, crucially, freedom of movement. They can come and go as they please. You know, that freedom of movement that Priti Patel boasted about removing, and we try to point out, she's boasting about removing it from British citizens, not EU citizens. They keep it. They come and go as they please. And so would be the best people for, let's say for example, you've got a London-based pension firm that you know provides services across the EU as well as in the UK. It makes more sense for them to hire an EU citizen because they can easily jet around Europe visiting clients in a way that a British employee could not. It's not that they can't go there, but there'll be delays, it'll take longer, it's not as efficient. Well done, Brexit. You've actually made it harder for those well-paid service jobs to go to British workers in the UK. Bravo. Actually, small exception, because if you're a UK citizen that's also Irish, hey, you can get Irish passport, quid's in. You get those benefits as well. Now, 
This is not just true of high flying jet setters in the financial sector either. Although, you know, that is damaging enough when you consider they contribute more to the public coffers than any other industry. Even lorry drivers are affected because although a no deal would have been absolutely disastrous for British hauliers, even the deal doesn't give them the same access as EU members. It's still less access. British lorry drivers can only, they can take a load to the, into the EU. Only so many though, again, the permits is still an issue, but they can, they can take a load to the EU, drop it off, pick another one up and then come straight back. Now, that's not necessarily the most efficient way to do things. Lorry drivers ideally may, need to be able to carry as many loads as possible. They don't just want to go one way and then back the other. They want to do like a circuit to maximize profitability. That will make, it, you're going to need EU drivers to do that uh, over British lorry drivers. Any job at all, in fact, where it is likely to be necessary to travel to other EU countries unimpeded, and it will simply make more sense to not employ British workers if you have the choice. So how the Brexiteers kept saying, oh, they're always choosing EU workers over British workers. No, that was never true before. But do you know what? Thanks to Brexit, it is actually going to be true in some sectors now. That actually is going to be true. <laughs> Finally, an amusing spin on this deal, as pointed out by Brexit been on Twitter. With this deal, Brexiteers have ended up coming to the rescue of German car manufacturers by guaranteeing them tariff-free sales in the UK. In fact, so obviously is this deal highlighting our weaknesses as a third nation that it seems obvious that it will now be the work of the next chapter of our history to build it back up. This isn't the end of it. You know, uh, they, they're trying to say that this is now it's so set in stone, our future relationship with the EU set in stone. Uh, that's what the Brexiteers are building it as. No, 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 no. I mean, apart from anything else, even the deal makes it certain that we will continue discussing. The agreement sets up a large number of committees, you know, joint UK EU committees on various aspects of cooperation, which have to meet at least once a year. So for those thinking that negotiations have ended at last, they have not. The deal actually stipulates that we keep negotiating measures on all sorts of areas in perpetuity. Because that's the reality of international relationships anyway, they're not set in stone. They're never set in stone. They constantly evolve and we're constantly talking. You know, it's just that they may increasingly feature less in the news, I suppose. But if you needed to explain the deal to someone who didn't really want to spend that much time understanding it, you could say this. It gives the EU a controlling say in Northern Ireland. Uh, their citizens and uh, have more rights in the UK than UK citizens. They get to control the rules for trading in services and their standards will also hold sway in trading in goods because if we diverge from their standards, they will slap tariffs and quotas on us. It's the deal that the EU wanted and not at all what the Brexiteers promised, even as recently as a week ago. And although this is because the EU are the much larger party and so would of course get the best deal, we might also look at how this started. This is the first meeting between Michel Barnier and first Brexit Secretary David Davis several years ago now. See how the EU officials have stacks of documents to refer to during the meeting. See how the three UK negotiators with David Davis in the middle have between them one notebook, not a very thick one even, and zero documents at all between them. We took this as a warning sign, those who were paying attention at the start, and it ended up like this. This is what we've had in charge of the process. So even though we were the smaller party, and of course we're gonna come away with a less beneficial deal than the EU, it still could have been better for us if we'd have had better people in charge of the process. But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.